Thank you for coming. My name is Scott Lewis. I'm at the University of South Florida. I'm also a member of Citrus, which is our center of um, improving teaching and research in undergraduate STEM education and creating cool acronyms. And a little bit about my outline for our talk. So what I'd like to do is to begin with um, what our experience was with peer leading, give you an idea of how we're enacting it, because there's a lot of different variants. And then I wanted to transition to trying to get um, modeling some peer leading. So if you were my peer leaders, how would I train you? And spend about 15 minutes on that. Hello, welcome. Have a seat. And then finally, what are the essential components of peer leading, which is kind of a good conversation to wrap up with, because it's the things you might think about if you were thinking about enacting something similar at your home institution. OK, so first off, why do this? What's the impetus? Why would we put in all this extra labor? And for me, it's because I firmly believe that active learning is an effective way to teach. So I've referenced this study down here with the Freeman et al. It's a meta-analysis. It was published in PNAS, uh, pub, um, National Academies publication. How many people are familiar with this article? OK, a few people. So what this is is a meta-analysis where they took about 250 different education research studies that used active learning and compared it to traditional lecture-based instruction. And the outcomes they saw were substantial. That when active learning was used, students learned more. And I've given this talk enough times. I've also talked to enough people about active learning and heard considerations and complaints and those kind of things. Whenever they hear about an individual research study, they start poking little holes in it. So for example, you might do a study. You might compare two groups. And they might say, well, those two groups, they weren't equivalent. Um, or they had different teachers. Or they were at different schools. The thing, though, is it's not one study that is the reason we believe in active learning. It's hundreds of studies. I liken it to what happened with the, the link between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer. So when their first few studies came out, a lot of people doubted them. They said, well, maybe those people just live in an area where you're going to get lung cancer. But then another dozen studies came out, and they happened to be in different places. And people came up with other things. Maybe they're doing something else that gave them lung cancer. Then thousands of studies came out, and every single time people smoked, they were getting lung cancer. And it became really implausible, unless you're a tobacco executive, to doubt all of those studies. And I think active learning's reached the same place. There's just this giant corpus of literature that's so compelling. So to me, that's the impetus, to make our classes as active as possible. So we've had a few sessions today on flipped classes. I'm presuming a lot of you are familiar with flipped classes. But just as a quick kind of review or definition for myself, to me, traditional instruction, you present your content in the class, and then you're expecting the students to engage in the content outside of class. And flipped would be that you want them to engage the content during your class time, and you would like to present the content outside of class time. Peer-led team learning is, it's first off, a nationally disseminated model. And it's used for engaging students. And what you do is you take students who have finished the course successfully, and you get them to return to the course and work with the students in that target course. And another key component, those students, they're trained to do this. They're trained to facilitate group work. So thinking about these two models, there's a quick kind of pro and con list that I come up with. For flipped class, one of the pro is you get your content coverage outside of class. That's efficient. But one of the cons is you have to manage an active class. And what do you do if you have a large class? There's actually a research study that I was reading. They had over 100 students in a class, and they flipped their class. And as they describe it, they spent a lot of time talking about how they made their videos, and maybe about two lines on what they did in their class. And those two lines were, this led us to have a class-wide discussion. What does a class-wide discussion look like when you have over 100 students? Any guesses? Chaos. 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 Pardon? Chaos. Or, Chaos. Or a few people talking and everybody else tunes out. Or a few people talking and everyone else tunes out. My ventured guess is there was one person talking. It happened to be the person who's teaching the class. And most of the other people were listening. And this discussion actually started to sound to me a lot like a lecture. Now, I'm guessing there was only those two lines. It just said, we had an in-class discussion with 100 people. 
Every time that I read the flipped and they start talking about large classes, it's a concern I have. What do you do with an active large class? It's not trivial. If there's more than 100 people in the room and there's just you, it's going to be really hard to manage that. Some people do other things where they, for example, um, bring in regular clicker questions, and then they use that to kind of guide where their class is going to go. And I think that's um, very novel. But one of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about is how much feedback do students get from that? So if, for example, you pose a question, and it's a clicker question, and some students get it wrong, yes, you can talk about why some people might get it wrong or what the right answer is. But if you think about each person, they may have made a different mistake, and they need to get feedback tailored to their own experiences. So if you had a small class, that's what you would do. You would actually take a look at what somebody's working on, and you'd say, oh, wait, you forgot this. You missed this sign, or you can't use this equation here. If you tell someone their clicker question's wrong, and you've got 100 people, you don't get that kind of tailored feedback. But the peer leading model gives you a chance to do that. The peer leaders can help you manage an active class because you can have peer leaders assigned to students, and they can get a reasonable number. So instead of a class of, say, 200 students, maybe you have each peer leader with 10 students or 12 students. One of the cons with peer leading, though, is how do you keep your content coverage going? You're dedicating your class time to having these peer leaders work with students on the content, but you can't present the content as much. And so for us, one of the things that kind of noted was these pros and cons cancel each other out. So when we decided to implement peer-led team learning, we actually did this in combination. We used a flipped approach to present the content outside of class, and then when they came into class, we managed an active class using peer leaders. So a little bit more information. First off, where I'm at, what it kind of looks like. It's a Gen Chem 2 class that I frequently teach. The class size is 250 students, give or take 25. Um, and then some of them don't show up. Twice a week, the class meets for 75 minutes. It's a coordinated class. And so what that means is we have many classes offered in any one semester. And all the instructors have gotten together and agreed that we'll use a common syllabus. We'll stay on the same kind of track. We'll use a common textbook. We'll actually even have common exams. And we'll create these exams by committee. All the students take the same exams at the same time. Now, the reason I mention this is um, actually for a very important reason. We're not able to do this with all our classes. So some of our classes are still using 100% lecture. You know, maybe they have clicker questions in there, things like that. No matter what, we're keeping the same pace with them because the students taking it with this approach are going to have the same exams at the same time as the classes that don't use this approach. So that was one of the things in designing this approach is that we had to maintain our amount of coverage. Same with depth. You know, we couldn't gloss over things. As far as grading goes, this goes to a bit for incentive for the students, and I'll get to unpack this a little bit more later. But there's three exams at 15% each, a final exam at 25% each. There's eight online homework assignments that comprise 10% of their grade. So 80% of their grade is common across all these classes. And then the instructor gets discretion for 20%. Whatever the instructor wants to do with that person's own class, they can do, and they can assign up to 20% of their grade for that. So for us to implement, one of the first things is how do we make the videos? And I'm not going to focus a whole lot on how to make the videos today, because I think there's people who do it a lot better than I do. Um, but we put together a team. We had two faculty. And also, there was two undergrad researchers who really just wanted to be engaged in a project. And um, kind of backstory, we got some funding to do this project. And it's like, well, we have to make videos, and you want to help. So you're going to help us make videos. It actually worked really, really well to get undergraduate students involved in making videos for a flipped class for a few reasons. One of which, are, the students don't have to hear my nasally voice on every single video. And the second of which is they bring a certain perspective and a certain amount of energy to the videos as well. You know, when they're talking with me about the content, you can actually see them thinking to themselves like, but if I say this and this, it doesn't make sense to me, so it won't make sense to them. So the students, I think, added a certain amount of legitimacy to it. One of our goals with this is we want our videos to be modular. So the average time was five minutes and 30 seconds. Our goal was five minutes per video. We thought if it was any longer, people probably aren't going to watch it a whole lot. But we also wanted it to be that each video is on a very specific topic. So it's chemistry. If we have a video on assigning intermolecular forces, that's it. And then if a student, two weeks after we present it, says, how do I assign intermolecular forces? Oh, there's that video titled that. So that they can always find the content they need, rather than I need to get to lecture number seven and go to minute number 38. So we were trying to make the videos really that modular kind of aspect. Our cap was 10 minutes. If a video is more than 10 minutes, 
No way, we had to do something else. We had to break it up. We focused on half the learning objectives for the class, and I'll show you why pretty soon, because we ended up doing this for half our class time. And so we had videos to present half the content for the class. And one of the things that kind of evolved over the semester is we found it easier to make videos on the mathematical problem solving. And in some ways, this made a lot of sense. You're in a large class. Chemistry's got a lot of content, a lot of concepts, and a lot of math. And I don't know if your classes are similar with that kind of balance. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But how many times in your class like that, that you're doing a math problem, and you start to realize, based on the questions you get, that there's some students who really need you to break it down in a lot more steps. You're going too fast for them. There's other students who are bored out of their mind. They figured out the answer three minutes ago. They're just waiting for you to get to the same answer. It's a problem when you have a large class. You have varying abilities. Videos are great. That first group, they can hit pause. They can think about it. They can get caught up. They can rewind and play it again. That second group, they can skip to the end and just see if they get the same number you did. And that way, I'm not doing as much math in the class. So this became our kind of weekly plan when we were doing this class. It's a 75-minute class that meets twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday. So I've bolded those two days. So the first thing that we would do is decide what will our students do on our Thursday class. Because our Thursday class is our active learning class. And that's what I've got right here. So we might do that on Friday, planning ahead for the next week. We made some, well, we posted the videos on Saturday, and we made some online quizzes to promote the students watching the videos. And so we'd post them on Saturday with a due date of Wednesday. And the idea was that those videos would help them get ready for the Thursday class when they were going to engage that content. We, on Tuesday, we would do our lecture day. So we'd present some content by lecture, and then some content would be presented by video. And on Thursday, that was our PLTL class. And so that was the entire problem solving day. So a bit more about that problem solving class. We used peer leaders to engage in it, as you can expect. We recruited them from past students who completed Gen Chem 2. And one of the questions I get a lot is, how do you recruit these students? How do you get them involved with it? The first time you do this, you really do have to hit the pavement. You've got to find students you think would do really well in it, meet with them, email them, encourage them, compliment them, tell them, like, you know, you really excelled in this. We could really use your help. And students get really kind of honored by that. And I think it's something that if they can help, they would like to. And later I'll talk on about incentives for them to participate in that kind of thing. After the first semester, it actually gets the ball rolling a lot more. Students came into a class and they had a peer leader. They know what peer leaders are. Some of them say, look, I want to do that. I mean, they come up to you at the end of class like, how do I get to be a peer leader next semester? It becomes so much easier to keep it sustained after you get it started. We got 23 peer leaders for our class of 250. And we're going for about a 12 to 1 student to peer leader ratio. And those students enrolled in upper level chemistry class for the training purposes. It was a double-edged sword. They got credit for training, and I think that's perfectly appropriate. They're learning how to communicate their chemistry content. We're challenging them on how to communicate that. They have to show responsibility to their students, um, a number of other things. But the double-edged sword part of it was, these are all top students, and it makes it clear to them that they've signed up for a semester-long commitment. This program doesn't work if the peer leader can go, hey, look, I got a test this week. I can't meet my students. That wouldn't work for us. But instead, no, you signed up for a class. And you care greatly about your GPA. You're a top student. If you don't come to this, this could hurt a grade that you receive in a class. And that really resonates with these students. It makes it clear this is not just a voluntary position. This is what it looks like. So one of the things that we do is we assign students to rows, and they have to sit in that assigned row on the Thursday class. The peer leader's also assigned a row. So the student gets the same peer leader every time. We want to build that rapport up. We're in a lecture hall. We don't really have any choice about that. So our students can't really work in groups much like if I, this room would be perfect, I think. If I had students here working together and a peer leader could visit them, that really facilitates group work. But this is what we've got. You can see right here, this is the start of class. These two peer leaders are actually getting students engaged from the beginning. This peer leader is waiting, and that's one of the things we discourage. Like, no, it's the start of class. You need to go and talk with them. Uh, but that gives you an idea of what it looks like. So even in this giant lecture hall, we're getting students working problems. One of the most awesome things about this, so what do I do during this time? I'm usually working as a peer leader, but I'm also, if I notice like some major problem coming up in class, I can go up in front of class and deliver a very mini lecture, something like that. 
but those are maybe 30 seconds, two minutes at a time. The other thing we do is a lot of clicker questions during this, so I'm the one running them as well. There's one other point I had on this slide, and I can't remember it. Sorry. Here's an example of some of the problems that they might engage with during that. Um, there's a lot of reading here, and I'll let you take a quick pass through. So I have a question about that. Yes. So you said you are also one of the peer leaders, right? So uh, do you stick to the same group, or do you move around? Oh, I go all over the room. I mean, they're all my students. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but because the other peer yes. leaders, they stick to a group. So what the group you are doing, pre you're the peer leader for what happens to them. So does somebody else take over? Well, there's usually enough students so that I'm working with a particular, like, two or three students, and they're working with some of their other nine students. So we use a variety of different questions, some of which are just conventional math questions like the first one. The second one is a bit more conceptual, and it's getting them to think a little bit more about what do these things mean in real life. The third one is um, different for a chemistry question because it's open-ended. So list all the facts you can. We've covered catalyst in three different chapters in this course. How many things can you come up with about it? One of the nice things about this from an instructor perspective is I'm able to then get to the front of the class and say, there's no one right answer here. Let's build the best answer we can. Let's start getting them called out. And I'll start hitting Microsoft Word and typing out all their answers as quick as I can. After we get them all, we do a quick review to figure out which ones we agree are accurate. And then I'll post that answer to the entire class after the session's done. It's great for you know, the day before the test that they're starting to build up these long list of connected concepts. Another interesting thing about the peer leading aspect, as we saw in Susan Ambrose's talk this morning, what she called the blind spot of experts, that the experts may not be able to understand the steps a novice might take to progress on something. It's another rationale for employing peer leaders in your class. The peer leaders wouldn't have that. Many of these peer leaders finished this course a few weeks prior, and so they can much more relate to what steps a novice might take on this. I don't entirely agree that an expert might not be able to do it, but I think it could be entirely easier for a peer leader to do it. So that discretion, that 20%, the way we split it up, 10% is clickers, we give them on the lecture class and on the peer leg class. Another 5% is those performance on the online quizzes. And then the final 5% is attendance to these classes. We view it as a mandatory part of the course. I really want the students to do it. I, if I make it voluntary, the ones who come aren't the ones that I most want to help. So instead, I make it a mandatory part of the course. We usually build in some freedom with this. There's 14 sessions. We ask them to come to 10 of them for full credit. That way, we're not managing every little attendance hiccup. You know, car broke down, you overslept, something like that. OK, you can miss four without a penalty. It just counts for that. Does it work? Without getting into a lot of detail, one of the things that we did is we had four classes that did it, four classes that didn't do it. The classes that did do it, we standardized their test scores. That's the blue line. The classes that didn't, their standardized test scores are the green line. In short, every single time we've done this, the classes that have employed this outperform the classes that have not employed this. So for us, it's compelling enough that it works. But beyond that, it's a lot of fun. And there's also a lot of peer leader development going on. For me, training the peer leaders is one of the coolest aspects about this. So if you're familiar with chemistry, one of the first topics presented in general chemistry one is the idea of the mole. And when I recruit peer leaders, a lot of them are apprehensive. What will I do if I don't know the answer? I'm going to look like an idiot, that kind of thing. And we encourage them. It's fine. Everybody feels this way. You'll do great. There's training. You're going to see all the problems the students see before you go in to meet with them each week. Three weeks later, they come back. They don't know what the mole is. It's amazing how much that switches, how they start to view their knowledge as useful and not something that everybody in the world always possesses. Instead, it becomes something that they could actually help others with. So can I ask you a quick question? Please. When you say you train the peer leaders, is that uh, an assignment for you as a class you're teaching? It is a course, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the reasons to do it, that flip PL, TL, the main reason, it facilitates active learning in our class. We've got 200 some students, and we're getting them all engaged. Now I remember the point from the side where everybody was working. When I stand in the back and look around and see 250 people working chemistry problems, that is just awesome. It's much better than anything I ever saw from a lecture perspective. Another fun part, when I work with faculty on this, and I've always tried to recruit other faculty to do it, I'm not the one teaching all these classes all the time. Um, the other faculty, it's really interesting. When students look on their phone during these active learning sessions, it bothers them greatly. 
We've gone through all this work. We've trained peer leaders. This is the best time that they could ever learn this content, and they're wasting it looking at their phone. I'm like, and that doesn't bother you when it happens during lecture? Apparently not. Apparently, there's, it's easier to justify it during a lecture, I think. It's scalable to any class size. Turn my class size to 400 next semester. OK, I'll find 15 more peer leaders. Problem solved. Preserves the content coverage. Like I said, we were keeping up pace with our lecture-based classes. And minimal cost. For us, it's an extra teaching assignment. A bit of background. What would happen is I would train the peer leaders each week. And it would be about two days before they meet with the students. And it would run like this. This would be the sheet the students would see this week. So I get the peer leaders the exact same sheet. And if you think about the role that I took on, I was going to your group and questioning about it. If you were stuck, I was trying to point out a couple things that could help. And if you weren't stuck, I was trying to challenge you. I was trying to ask you to explain it in another way or to answer a follow-on question. The reason I do that is because that's what I want the peer leaders to do. Those are the two big tasks that I assign to the peer leader. You're a resource if they get stuck. And as a resource, it's the smallest thing you can provide to get them going again. I tell the peer leader, if you've got 12 students, you don't have time to lecture. You don't have time to solve a problem for a student from beginning to end. You've got 12 students. You've got 75 minutes. If you spent five minutes solving a problem, you've lost too much time. Instead, it's more just, oh, you looked at this number instead of that number. Or you didn't think about this, but then you're on to the next group. Because one of the goals is that I visited each group in a timely fashion. And then the second part about challenging the students we all know that they're not going to see these exact same questions on the test. What really matters is whether they can take the process and enact it. And the way to tell if they can take the process is to ask people questions about the process, to be able to tell, you know, can they take this and go somewhere else? So a follow-up question for me on the last one would be, is there twice as many hydrogens with CH4 as there is with H2O? Because it's a 50-50 question. They could have just picked one. But if they can start articulating the ratio of hydrogen between the two, then I've got a better idea for it. You know, or I could ask them to turn it into actual numbers. How many hydrogens are there? You know, four moles times Avogadro's number. So I'm able to push them a bit more. So the question I think that you have to ask yourself is, do you think you could train undergraduate students to take on this role? One of the things that I hear a lot of concerns about is you know, undergraduate students aren't teachers. They're not ready to teach. But what I was doing wasn't teaching in that conventional sense in that I wasn't standing up here and doing an exposition showing off you know, a wealth of knowledge. Instead, it was a skill set that was particular to the sheet. One of the questions came up, and it's a great question, is what happens if the students ask a question the peer leaders just aren't prepared for, aren't ready for, don't know the answer to? And my coaching for that is you need to refer them to the instructor. And it's perfectly fine, particularly anything not related to the worksheet. This happens as we get close to test review all the time, test coming up. The students pull out the test review sheet, and they're like, can you help me with this one? And for the peer leaders, this is what I call answering questions cold. With the sheet that they're prepped on, they're ready for it. They're warm. They're anticipating it. But if you just pull a question out of a chemistry book somewhere and say, solve that, that's a different skill set. If you've taught the course a few times, you have that skill set. You've thought of these questions enough. But if you're a peer leader and this is the first time working with students, it's like your first time teaching. Answering questions cold is a very challenging task. I tell them, look, if it's really apparent and you've got the answer, and even if the answer key's there and it's matching it, I mean, if all those good signs show up and you want to help them, great. But otherwise, ask your instructor. You know, it's a great way to talk to the instructor. A few other things about this that's also quite interesting. I've done a lot of observations of peer leaders. And that's one of the ways that I evaluate the peer leaders. I've done it when the students are my students, and I've done it when the students are someone else's students. The room changes when the instructor is by the students and when the instructor is not. When I'm by the students, it's no more the, how do I do this? Instead, you get a few students that are like, is this right? And they know perfectly well it is. Um, there's a lot less risk taking in front of the instructor. But in front of the peer leaders, they seem a lot more comfortable to do that, a lot more comfortable to step out on a limb and say, here's what I'm thinking. What's wrong? So those kind of things. So some of the essential components of peer leading, if you're thinking about implementing it, um, these are what they call the six critical components. I'll let you read through them. Now, I started by saying this is a nationally disseminated model. And this is the critical components as outlaid by the people who are the founders, essentially, of the model. 
I'm a firm believer in what has to be done naturalistically, which is your implementation will vary and it has to. You need to make the best decisions for your class and what you're comfortable with. One of the things, for example, that they recommend that I stray from is they recommend groups of six to eight and the peer leader only meets with that group of six to eight and it's a two hour long session and they work a very challenging problem together. One that involves multiple components that everyone has to contribute to. You know, I, not that I particularly disagree with it, but it doesn't match our logistics. It doesn't match our ratio of students to peer leaders. We don't have a giant table for eight people to sit. We don't have a two hour time block. So I abandon that one. Instead, I look for groups of four if possible, or if we're in the lecture hall, it's the two people sitting next to each other. We make do with what we have. And I'd encourage you to do the same if you're going to implement this. Don't look at any of these things and say, oh, this one here, I can't do it, so I'm out. Instead, it's more, all right, what do we adapt? What are we going to change? Because I think it is a very flexible approach. Uh, a little bit of unpacking. The PLTL is integral to the course. Um, that can mean different things to different people. Some people mean you just have to reference it in the class. And that's one of the things that we do frequently is, let's say I go back into the lecture class and I know a lot of people struggled with the last question on the worksheet, and that's actually the bridge to where we start. I can even start my lecture class by showing that question and saying, now, it seems like we had a lot of struggling here, and today we're actually going to figure out how we could solve that one. Um, one other thing that's kind of interesting, I talked about how peer leaders are not teaching the course. If I fall a little bit behind on the content, one of the things that I can do is something I did here, the top of the sheet. I scaffolded a problem. And that's something you can always do to say, OK, look, I really wanted to cover this in class, but I didn't have time. Next class is our problem solving session. I know, why don't I just put a quick example in the problem solving session and then we're back on track. So those are some of the things you can do. You can use your problem sets to help guide that instruction. The peer leaders are trained. I think you, know, you got to feel for my perspective on that and how to do it. For me, it's one of the key things that tends to differentiate this from how I've seen supplemental instruction being implemented. And I know supplemental instruction has a lot of different variants, in some ways learning assistance as well. But I've seen supplemental instruction where there isn't a regular training. Um, for example, I've known where there's an English faculty member and she's in charge of SI across the entire university. And so she'll recruit all these great students and you know, one student's assigned to chemistry and that student will have chemistry help sessions outside of class, that kind of thing. There's merit to that, but there is not chemistry training. If that student has a misconception in chemistry, they're not going to get that feedback in their training. But if it's a chemistry faculty member training chemistry peer leaders, if it's a biology faculty member, you get the point. If the training is topic-based, I think you gain a lot from that. Some of the questions that I was asking you here, that only comes from the pedagogical content knowledge of knowing your discipline. You know, when you teach something a few times, you come to anticipate where students will struggle, and being able to relate that in the training is important. The faculty are involved and supportive. I've seen peer leading um, happen where it was forced upon faculty members, and the faculty member goes up and really just during their lecture says, well, I could cover this, but you have to waste your time in peer leading this week. You can already understand how that just dampens the mood. It makes the peer leading role very difficult. It makes it a lot less effective. If the faculty aren't involved and supportive, it's not going to work. Um, it should never be forced upon somebody, is kind of my opinion. Materials are challenging and promote group work. Like I said earlier, this is the one that I kind of waffle on a bit. Yes, I think that they're challenging, but I don't think they're in line with how the founders kind of decided it. Space is established for group work, um, makes sense. And then finally, institutional support, especially if you're just starting in your teaching career. This is something that you need to test the waters with slowly. I always advise particularly new faculty members, just teach the way everyone else is teaching your first year. Show everyone that you can do it before you decide to do something that might be a bit unexpected. As far as getting peer leaders, we've gone the credit hour route. And so one of the nice things about it that I talked about, it formalizes the training, it acknowledges their new skills. It does cost a teaching load. Sometimes we've done it as overload and that's been kind of how I've justified it is, okay, look, it's not costing the department anything, I'm just gonna teach an extra class. Um, for me, I kind of have a dual purpose because my research is chemistry education and the peer leading helps with some of the research studies that I do. Um, another option though would be to pay the peer leaders. For me, that option, it still has that, you have to train them, there's still time involved with that, even if it's not a formal course, so you might be able to cut down on how much training you do. I've also kind of found that the pay option doesn't seem to be as great of an incentive for students. And it's, I don't know about your university, but 
a boat of paperwork to pay anybody the smallest amount and multiply that by 25 people. Um, I would rather pay them out of pocket than do all the paperwork to pay them a couple hundred dollars each for the semester. So we've done an upper level course and like I said, I'd modeled the peer leading. It's the same course the students would see. And all of this is an emphasis on active learning. And then process, not results. A question came up, would I grade these sheets that the students do? The answer would be no, for a few reasons. One of which is, students are first learning this. And I don't want it to be that they get penalized because they didn't learn it fast enough. But second, I don't want them to focus on the results. If they can walk out of there knowing how to do the first half of the sheet, I prefer that than if they walk out of there with all the right answers listed on the sheet. Another question that hasn't come up yet is, do you post answers to these sheets? And people debate this. Um, my own preference is this. If I post the answers, I see students shut down earlier. Oh, I don't need to do it. I'll just wait till you have the answer shown. The compromise that I've made is this, because students really don't like never getting the answers to it. And I encourage them, like, come to my office hours. Let's talk about it if you have questions. They don't always do that. So I take the clickers and use it as an opportunity. At the end of class, we do a vote. The students enter in the number of the question they had the most difficulty with. And whichever two questions had the most votes, I will work the solution to them and post them. And the thing I like about that is it's not a blank check. They know they're not going to get the answers to the entire sheet. But at least they don't get the feeling that you know, if they tried really hard and figured out most of them, they're still left with that unsatisfying feeling of a couple that they couldn't get. Instead, the worked solution could be up there to help them. So how do I evaluate peer leaders when I do this? There's many different ways to do this, but one of my prime ways is reflective journals. And I usually do this every other week where I just give them a theme, and different themes have been what went well and what didn't? Or how do you get your students engaged from the start of class? One of my favorite ones is proactive versus reactive. And we talk about that in a few lenses, but one of my favorite ones is early in the semester, the peer leaders are directed by and if you watch it long enough, it's the same students always doing that. Their job is not to always work with those same students. And I think you've already found as a teacher, you've got a job to do with the students who don't call for attention all the time. And so how do you start those conversations as a peer leader? How do you make sure that all students are getting your attention equally? And so that's just a journal topic. And then once I have the journal topic, the nice part is I tell them before they go in, this week I want you to focus on proactively engaging all your students and tell them exactly what I mean by that. And then when I go to watch, I can actually see them starting to focus on it because they're going to have to write about it. You know, how did they do that in, right after that class? I've done observations where I go in and observe them. I'll show you a rubric of that soon. They're always done in a constructive manner. Um, ideally, I would do it this way. I would tell them, I'm going to observe you twice during the semester. And if the first time, if I notice anything that I call you know, an area of concern, the next time I want to just see some effort being made toward that area. I always try and do this as a learning model for the peer leaders. So I'm not being um, punishing them, I guess would be the word for it. Instead, it's more I'm trying to help them develop their skills as well. I know they're going out on a limb themselves when they take this. And in some ways, it's interesting because you play a more support model than you typically do. I found myself being their cheerleader a bit more than I would for other students. You know, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for going out there. I know the students appreciate it. They need to hear that kind of thing because they're getting some of the stuff that you get that's a little bit dismaying. They're getting some of the students saying like, this is crap, I don't want to do this. And they're still keeping on a positive face, but they need to know what they're doing is okay. The other thing about evaluating them is I've always told them this. I evaluate you on your actions not your student's actions. If you've got a student who wants to look at his phone the entire time, there's some steps in place for the course where they don't get credit for attendance for that, but that is not a demerit on that peer leader. Uh, just as I wouldn't mark a teacher down because they might have had a student not paying attention. So instead, it's more, did you take on what I asked you to do? Did you spend your time dedicated to helping your students? And then that responsibility to students. Some of the things they do is they take attendance. They need to be there on time. I let them know that you're representing the university. When you're a student, you walk in late. You come to the back of the class. You hope no one notices. If you're a peer leader, you walk in late. Everyone noticed, and it's a problem. You've already started your class off on a bad foot. So these are some of the themes I've done for the Reflective Journal. I'll let you read through. So this would be an observation rubric, and 
I just set up the different kind of things that I want. This was one I had developed when the peer leaders had their own rooms. So I encouraged them. They had to move the desk around so students can work in groups. So when I came in, I wanted to see that. I didn't want to see the desk all set up like a lecture. Um, this was a room that had two peer leaders walking. And one of the things I talked to them about was don't duplicate the peer leader's efforts. You see a peer leader on that side of the room, you should be on this side of the room. You shouldn't be following each other around, just making sure the same students get met every 10 seconds. So those are some of the things that I had as point of emphasis. And this is just a quick rubric that I developed. If I saw something down here under like no evidence, then that would be something I'd meet with this peer leader afterwards about. How many people here have had their teaching observed? OK, of you, how many people got feedback on that observation? Just about everyone, great. If there was any length of time between when you were observed and when you got that feedback, think about how you felt. It is nerve wracking. It's human nature. Somebody came and judged me today. I don't have that judgment yet. What went wrong? That's what goes on in your mind. Peer leaders would do the exact same thing. If you're going to observe them, my advice is this. As soon as possible, relay your feedback to them. And they typically find that it's overwhelmingly positive because there's so many good things to talk about what they do. The truth is, when I do this, some of them put in so much more energy than I can put forth, and I tell them that. And that's one of the big assets of this. Other things I've done, I've had peer leaders observe other peer leaders. This is really cool. There's 20 some of them. And if they have separate rooms and they're on different schedules, for example, they can go find someone else and I just make that an assignment that they have to do. I give them a set of questions they have to answer. And then one of the things they do is they turn it into me so I can make sure that it's constructive and polite. And then I ask them to share it with the peer leader they observed. One of the best parts about it, though, when you first start teaching, I don't think we all realize this all the time. I certainly didn't. But you make lots of decisions. Hundreds of them. What are you going to do to start class? How are you going to move around the room? Implicit decisions, ones you're not even aware of. Then you teach for year after year. Those decisions no longer are decisions. They're routines. You don't question them at all. Peer leaders get into the same thing. When they go see another peer leader, they're shocked by how different that class is. And it's really fun to watch. They'll say things like, you know what? They just passed around a sign-in sheet for attendance, and I've been taking five minutes calling out everyone's name at the start of class. That's brilliant. I want to do that. And it's like, <laughs> go ahead. Many times, they emulate the peer leader they had, and you know, they put their stamp on it. But to see someone else, they can start building a community of best practice, and that's really fun to see. Um, so those are some of the questions that I've had during their observations. I usually don't just tell people, go in the room and write down what you see. Instead, I give them some things to particularly look for. And then responsibility to students. One of the things that I have in their syllabus is very clear to them. If they're late, it's going to start affecting their grade. Um, they've got my cell phone number. If something's really dire, they need to tell me. If you are going to do this, one good rule of thumb, especially if you have a big program like we do, you get more peer leaders than you need. I said 23 peer leaders is what we use for a class of 250. We needed 21 to make our ratio work if you did the math. 21 works just fine for us. We bring in two more peer leaders as floaters during the class, but they're also step-ins if a peer leader can't make it that day. <coughs> I can fill in for a peer leader, but what happens if two of them are gone? The floaters give me some flexibility for that. So I train them just like everyone else. If all the students are there, great, they can still help with, with somebody. But if somebody's gone, they can step in and take on that role. So I wanted to acknowledge some people that really helped us build this. Um, Rosanna Waney and Nuri Chung helped with making those videos. Um, those are the two undergraduate students that I mentioned. Um, Andrea and Roseanne helped with the evaluation part of compiling it, those test statistics. Um, Lee and Constantine were some graduate students that helped us in terms of developing this project. Rong Zhang was the other faculty member that I met with in terms of making the videos as well. The peer leaders and the students certainly. Um, obviously, we can't do any of this without them. NSF was our support from the beginning. And I guess have to acknowledge them. As far as a couple references go, so this first reference, it's a JCAMED article, and it really talks about how to implement it with those six kind of criteria. It also has a lot of references in it to some of the original work, if you're interested in. If you're really interested in um, the flipped one that I talked about, that's what, sorry, the flipped one is up here. This one down here is how to implement it in general. And if you're really interested in the evaluation, that's up here with the flipped one. 
If you want to see some of the videos, that kind of thing, we have uploaded them as supplementals, but I'm also really willing to share all the worksheets that we've done, all the videos. They're chemistry specific, but they might give you an idea. Our videos are screencasts, so you're not going to see me the whole time. Probably a good thing. Thank you very much, and if I can be of any help, please email.